Basically, what this would do if implemented is eliminate the entire structure of labor law in the United States that's existed since the 1930s and take us back to a, a 1920s world. I think the goal is pretty simple. It's not just about undoing the work of the Biden-Harris administration to raise standards for workers, but it's really about undoing the progress of the last hundred years when it comes to workplace protections. The challenge for union builders is this isn't the economy of the 70s where everyone goes to this place called work for five days and does 40 hours and then goes home. It's not the case. So we have to acknowledge and recognise the complexities and run towards them and embrace them. There is a communist witch hunt happening at institutions of higher education and Lorch gets caught up with it. According to Lorch, he goes to testify and he says that local segregationists prompted that subpoena to punish him and the institution um, for his activism. Hey, you're listening to the Labor Radio Podcast, weekly produced by the Labor Radio Podcast Network, laborradionetwork.org. I'm Chris Garlock. On today's show, Project 2025 and the labor movement, the plan to destroy worker power, universal basic income and the four-day week, the AAUP, and the Black Freedom Struggle, 1955 to 1965. This week's featured shows are On the Line, Power at Work, the Organizing for Change podcast, and AAUP Presents. That's all ahead on this week's edition of the Labor Radio Podcast Weekly. Here's the show. We begin with On the Line, the podcast from a network of union members and leaders who cover, analyze, and draw lessons from the struggles of workers across the country to build a fighting labor movement. All labor has dignity. So glad to be joined by Mike Kramer to discuss the 2024 presidential elections as it relates to the labor movement and what the future could hold. Mike currently serves as the executive vice president of Unite Here Local 26, where he has led major organizing campaigns and strikes in the service and hospitality sector. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hi, Hussein. Hi, Rachel. Glad to be here. Mike, can you can you give us an overview of, you know, what is Project 2025? I'm sure maybe we've heard this term floating around a little bit, but, you know, why should the average person even care to know what this this platform is? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, Project 2025, as you said, Rachel, is an initiative of the Heritage Foundation, which is uh, a far right think tank uh, that's kind of associated with the most extreme wing of the Republican Party. Uh, so it's not a uh, not something that's been put out by the Trump campaign directly. That they've put out their own more brief set of uh, policy initiatives uh, called uh, Agenda Forty Seven. But Project Twenty Twenty Five is very closely associated with the Trump campaign uh, because of, as you said, the involvement of uh, Trump advisors. And by just the set of policies that it contains is clearly very Trump driven and associated with this MAGA wing of the Republican Party. Uh, it, it really, it's a set of policies designed to massively restructure the, the federal government as it currently exists and scale back or eliminate uh, some of the basic hard-won democratic rights that, that working people enjoy in the United States. I mean, there's hundreds of pages in, the, in this document on all types of things, but can you speak specifically to, you know, how Project 2025 could potentially impact the labor movement? Yeah, I mean, basically what this would do if implemented is eliminate the entire structure of labor law in 
the United States that's existed since the 1930s and take us back to uh, a 1920s world. Um, and it does that through uh, through a number of things. One, it uh, eliminates things that have have really been used to to grow unions in a number of sectors. Um, as you both are well familiar with, the the process under the National Labor Relations Act for forming unions through elections is a dramatically flawed process. It's you know far from anything like a free and fair election. And so the way that many unions have gotten around this is uh, engaged in campaigns to win paths for to voluntary recognition through through card check. But one of the things that Project 2025 would do would be to make such uh, agreements illegal so that the only path to union recognition would be through secret ballot elections are as I said, far from free and fair. One of the central ways that construction unions uh, have been able to improve construction jobs is through project labor agreements. They're a uh, you know, basic way that, uh, that building trades unions have been able to transform those jobs into good and safe jobs, what can be uh, a very dangerous industry. Uh, Project 2025's policy initiatives would make project labor agreements illegal and mm. uh, set back the health and safety gains in the construction fields. Well, and that's where you get to the most, uh, in my mind, one of the most uh, scary pieces of this is they promote something called uh, labor management uh Empl employee involved they said they call it employee involvement organizations right and so really it's a new name for something very old uh company unions something that's that's outlawed under labor law in the united states uh but if you have an employer dominated union uh a union in name alone but something that really serves the interests of the employer so all of the basic protections that we have today as, again, as insufficient as they are, are, are under attack in this project 2025 agenda. And the, the goal really being to massively weaken unions. They know that organized workers are a powerful force and the, uh, the goal of the Heritage Foundation is to make the formation and growth of unions much, much more difficult. Mike, thank you so much for, for joining thank us today. You, Mike. And we're looking forward to having you on in the future. Yeah, glad to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to talking more in the future. Hello, powerful people. Welcome back to Power at Work. My name is Seth Harris, and I'm a senior fellow at the Burns Center for Social Change. Thank you very much for joining this blogcast. I think you're going to find that it's perhaps the most important blogcast that we have ever done. Jody Calamine is the brand new director of advocacy for the AFL-CIO, but he's had a long career in national labor and labor policy circles. Before joining the AFL, he was a senior fellow and the director of labor and employment policy at the Century Foundation. Carla Walter is the director of the American Worker Project at the Center for American Progress. I think the goal is pretty simple. It's not just about undoing the work of the Biden-Harris administration to raise standards for workers, but it's really about undoing the progress of the last hundred years when it comes to workplace protections. And so the other law that really caught my attention or weakening of protections that caught my attention was the changing of child labor laws to allow teens to be exposed to hazardous work. And they use this jargon about teens really being interested in exploring hazardous industries. But, you know, this is a real threat, first of all. We've seen eight, eight states already work to weaken child labor laws. So this is moving. Um, but it's also just this rollback to we think about child labor and we think of images of kids going down into mines and kids working in, in sweatshops. 
and they're contemplating exposing kids to hazardous working environments in meat processing and manufacturing and heavy equipment erasing the fact that these are work these are kids that are oftentimes living at the margins and are living in poverty that are having to make these sort of desperate choices and acting as if this is not something that's that's really just walking away to basic values american values yeah i think this is the way i would think about everything in here at least with respect to the wages benefits job standards they fall into three categories the first category is a category where they eliminate the floor upon which we stand. Federal employment laws uh, create those floors, those standards by which we work. The overtime law creates a standard work week uh, so we can have a predictable schedule and get to spend time with our kids. The minimum wage makes it illegal for employers to pay below a, a certain rate, but this Project 25 agenda erases all of these things. They drop the floor out from workers. Our everyday lives uh, will be less secure we will have to, we'll have less control over those lives without these basic standards in place. Um, uh, you'd have to work longer hours to make ends meet. Your kids will be invited to work in dangerous occupations. Um, you'll find your life uh, and health at risk more frequently on the job. The second category of proposals here is a whole set of categories peppered throughout the document, not just in the Department of Labor, but definitely in the Department of Labor um, that are hostile to civil rights, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They want to free up employers to engage in discrimination. And we can expect all of that uh, discrimination or much of it to be against non-white people and women. Those workers will face the brunt of the loss of that floor from category one of the proposals. Um, uh, so yes, their plan is to eliminate the OFCCP, which um, is a, an office at the Department of Labor that protects workers against discrimination if they work at a, at a federal contractor. Um, uh, but they don't want to uh, eliminate the EEOC. And there's a reason for that. They want to flip civil rights law on its head. At the EEOC, their plan in this document is to use Title VII to go after employers who engage in diversity, equity, and inclusion training. In other words, there won't be any more anti-racism, anti-harassment training on the job. And that means uh, you can expect what that, how that would uh, play out in time, uh, you would see the normalization of everyday racism and everyday sexism, more division um, in, in the workplace and, and in our lives. And then the third category of proposals here, um, I think it sticks out um, as you read through uh, uh, the list of things that, that you mentioned, um, is the fact that they want to privilege a particular kind of employer, a religious employer, mm -hmm. whatever rights workers might have after they've slashed all these other rights, um, and if they're slashing so many of them throughout this document, employers will be empowered uh, to utilize religious exemptions uh, uh, for, to, to, to get out of the rest of those, those obligations to their, to their workers. Um, so uh, whether you keep your job or whether you can get a job may entirely depend upon whether you satisfy your boss's religious views. Uh, once you've entered a world Remember, category one, category two, category three. Once you've entered a world um, where you have no right to a minimum wage, no right to overtime pay, um, uh, uh, no health and safety, no limits on hours, you become very insecure. Employment will be a very fragile thing. You will be reliant on your boss's good graces. And, and the boss can literally lord his religion over you. This is a document about workers losing their freedom. It's a document about you no longer controlling your life. That is what is, that is the architecture in this document. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you learned a lot. We look forward to seeing you back here on Power at Work again very soon. Welcome to Organising for a Change, the podcast for union builders with me, Simon Sapper. And me, Martin Smith. And today we're going to be talking about four-day weeks and universal basic income. But I suppose the question some listeners might have, Martin, is why? Well, the economy that we're trying to build unions in is fundamentally different than the economy we were trying to build unions in when I first started, in many, many ways. 
Some of it supercharged by the 2008 crash. Some of it supercharged by lockdown and a whole range of things. But we, we're now in a situation where we've got the dubious privileges in the UK labour market of the simultaneously not having enough work to go around everyone and that work being really badly shared out. So broadly, a quarter of the workforce can't get enough hours of work and want more because of low pay. And broadly, a quarter of the workforce are working far too many hours and are being overworked. And so there's two linked suggestions to tackle both ends of that spectrum. One is to move the average working week down to four days, 28 hours, and also to go more formal to some form of basic income pilots to build on what's already in place. I agree absolutely with the analysis and that if we're talking about effective union building in the modern economy in the mid-2020s, these things are very much in play, not least because they're ideas that have been kicked around for, for decades. But added to the mix is the fact that they are, in economic terms, no-brainers. There's no-brainers that actually, if you pay people the same amount but only over four days, necessarily you have an improvement in productivity, but you also give people more time to spend their money in the, yeah. in the economy. And if you tie that with universal basic income, as you say, you're just reflecting something that's happening with the current deployment of universal credit anyway, but you give people agency, more agency over what they spend. Yeah. Not that actually even if we had a UBI of, say, £100 a week, it would make a huge difference but it well actually that's true it would make a huge difference to the lowest paid paid workers but it's not going to see them going out and booking a flight to vegas to to spend their newfound wealth or anything like that now there's been a whole range of discussions around what is or isn't achievable people were saying not that long ago that well uh, you can't couldn't have a four-day week uh, in a, a five-day week service and what's really interesting one of the private school companies and most schools in the UK now run by private businesses as we know, one of them just three weeks ago moved to a nine day fortnight as a step along the way to a four day week. And they've just organised their shifts accordingly. So it is possible to move to a four day week in more or less any industry you, you, you think about. Oh, for sure. I mean, nine day fortnights, 14 day, three weeks uh, right. uh, have been part of the landscape for donkey's years. But what's really important in union building is the only people that should call it of what they are prepared to accept as a step along the road to four-day week is the workforce themselves in that employer. And that, I think, is how we'll achieve the four-day week. Well, the only way we get the organising dividend of that, or the union building dividend, if you like, is if this is something that actually the workforce say, oh, we're not thought of that before, but actually, yeah, I really like the sound of that. I really think we, we should do that. And the, and the challenge for union builders is the complexity we started with. This isn't the economy of the 70s where everyone goes to this place called work for five days and does 40 hours and then goes home. It's not the case. So we have to acknowledge and recognise the complexities and run towards them and embrace them. So the irony, of course, we're now in is the general unions in the UK fought for a reduction in the working hours, two, eight hours in 1889. We've got a very large portion of our neighbours and friends in this country at the moment who would desperately want to increase their hours uh, to eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah. And that complexity is not to defeat the four-day week campaign. It means that it's got to mean uh, a move to regularised hours for everyone on a general reduction in the amount of work people are doing. So pe we can finally end the 60 and 70 hour weeks that are still very, very common, all too common, but at the same time share out the working hours that are available more equitably so people who need extra hours can get those extra hours. And with basic income, running alongside that has got to be then a move towards doing something about state subsidised low pay because people often need more hours because their pay is so low. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are kind of flip sides of the same yeah. coin, I would, I, I would say. This episode of Organising for a Change is brought to you with the support of Thompson's, the leading trade union and social justice law firm, the General Federation of Trade Unions, delivering trade union education, Building Solidarity and the Home of Strike Map, Pellacraft, award-winning and trusted supplier of promotional goods, and the Battersea and Wandsworth Trades Council. Your hosts have been Simon Sapper and Martin Smith. Music is by Scott Holmes. Contact the show at organising at makesyouthink.com. Organising for a Change is a Makes You Think production.
Welcome to AAUP Presents, the podcast of the American Association of University Professors. I'm the host, Mariah Quinn, AAUP's digital organizer. In this episode, we look back to the 1950s to the 1970s and at the intersection of the Black freedom struggle and AAUP's work protecting academic freedom. My guest is Joy Williamson Lott, the Dean of the Graduate School and Professor of Social and Cultural Foundations in the College of Education at the University of Washington. She's the author of Jim Crow Campus, Higher Education and the Struggle for a New Southern Social Order. She's also a fellow in AAUP's new Center for the Defense of Academic Freedom. We're discussing her article, The AAUP and the Black Freedom Struggle, 1955 to 1965, which was published in the spring 2024 edition of AAUP's Academe magazine. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank you. Let's kick things off with a broad question. How would you briefly sum up AAUP's involvement in supporting desegregation, racial equity, and protecting academic freedom as it related to those movements in higher ed in the 50s and 60s? Well, between 1957 and 1975, so going a little bit past the um, date that you just mentioned, the AAUP censured 15 Southern institutions during that time frame, 57 to 75, eight of them were uh, censured for firing faculty who spoke or wrote in a way that questioned the legitimacy of white supremacy. They weren't necessarily writing radical treaties. They were um, just interrogating the worth of white supremacy. And when institutions did work to remedy what happened to address the censure, It was often because of national pressures, like the threat of the loss of accreditation, as well as the possible loss of federal funding that motivated them to change course, rather than AAUP censure in the way that I understand it in my work. Because, for instance, white trustees let black public institutions remain on the censure list for multiple years. I think one of them was on the censure list for 22 years. But when I think about the AAUP involvement and where it was important It was really with institutions who aspired to be more, to be research centers, have a national reputation. They wanted to attract faculty from across the nation, not just within their state. And so if an administration was under AAUP censure, that was a negative mark against the institution. Faculty who cared about academic freedom would know that. Faculty who taught doctoral students would know that and care about it. So like, would a stellar faculty member want to move their family there, do their work there, if the legislature and other public officials or even the trustees interfered in intimate campus business at will. So it definitely damaged the institution's reputation and even their aspirations. Um, So there's a lot of interesting case studies in your piece. Let's start with Fisk University, which was a black private institution. You write about the firing of Professor Lee Lorch, a move that led to the AAUP censoring Fisk after carrying out a formal investigation and publishing a report in 1959. Can you tell us what happened in this case? Yeah, so in 1950, Fisk, which is in Nashville, they hire Lee Lorch. He's a white math professor and well-known activist for black rights. Lorch develops this great reputation as an instructor. um, Students love him. The faculty love him. He achieves the rank of full professor within a few years. And he also continues to agitate on behalf of blacks, focusing on dismantling school segregation locally. So in 1954, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, They subpoena Lorch to answer questions about his alleged affiliation with the Communist Party. This is the Cold War era. There is a communist witch hunt happening at institutions of higher education, and Lorch gets caught up with it. According to Lorch, he goes to testify, and he says that local segregationists prompted that subpoena to punish him and the institution Um, for his activism, and they want to smear Fisk's reputation. So he testifies he didn't currently hold, in 1954, hold membership in the Communist Party USA, but he refused to answer questions about past membership. So then HUAC finds him in contempt, and the next day, Fisk's president, Charles S. Johnson, tells the local white press that the institution would consider dismissing him. So Johnson argues that Lorch's brand of activism inflames local white racism and damages the struggle for black advancement. He had had a different vision of the pathway for black advancement than Lee Lorch did. And so he's a pragmatic president who's leading a black institution in a white supremacist context. 
So Johnson's proposal to fire Lorch creates a huge crisis on campus among the students, faculty, and staff, as well as the trustees. So on one side, you have some faculty, staff, students, alumni, as well as the local AAUP chapter and the national AAUP watching this. And you also have the local and national NAACP watching this and argue that white supremacists were being opportunistic. They were building on this anti-communist sentiment of the era to try and quell the black freedom struggle in Nashville. So at first, at first, Fisk trustees, they're a racially mixed group. They're split on how to handle Johnson's suggestion to fire Lorch. They have a variety of different votes. Eventually, they vote to fire Lorch in a decision that divided largely among racial lines, with all white trustees voting to fire him and black trustees voting to retain him. And after the trustees take that action, then the AAUP um, does an investigation and censures the administration. But Lorch leaves the institution, so he's fired. He moves to another black college campus, Philander Smith, which is in Arkansas, with a glowing letter of recommendation from President Charles S. Johnson. So Lorch continues, continues his academic career and even um, his activism at a different institution. I'm the host, Mariah Quinn. Thanks for listening to AAUP Presents. And that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Labor Radio Podcast Weekly. It's just a small sample of the amazing programs aired last week on the more than 200, that's right, 200 Labor Radio and Podcast shows. They are all part of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, shows that focus on working people's issues and concerns. We've got links to all the network shows, laborradionetwork.org. You can also find them. Use the hashtag laborradiopod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And, you know, you can be part of the network. You don't even need a microphone. Labor Radio Podcast Network t-shirts are available. They're union-made. You'll find them in all sizes and two colors at laborradionetwork.org. This podcast is recorded under a SAG after collective bargaining agreement. The Labor Radio Podcast Weekly, edited this week by Patrick Dixon. I produce the show, and our social media guru, as always and forever, is Mr. Harold Phillips. For the Labor Radio Podcast Weekly, this has been Chris Garlick. Stay active and stay tuned to your local Labor Radio Podcast show. We will see you next week.